Hello everyone, it's great to welcome you here to our, what's our last online service until after the summer. And actually it's going to be my last online service ever because as most of you know, uh, Steve and I are moving on now. Uh, and I want to use this opportunity to say thank you to all of you so much for being part of this online community. It's been great being able to worship together in this way and whether you're near to Barford or far away, we've really enjoyed worshipping God together. Just a quick reminder to you that if you would like online worship to continue uh, when we reconvene in September, you do need to get in touch and let Zoe, our administrator, know. Uh, her email address is on the website and it's administrator at stswithensbarford.co.uk. Uh, because at the moment we're not sure whether to carry on with one online service a month or to stop them altogether. So once again, thank you, thank you and bless you as you go into the summer. Today, uh, as we gather, we're thinking about King David. He's not yet king. And this week we're thinking about his friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan. I'll be speaking to you a little bit later about that. There'll be activities for the children, there'll be communion, and there'll be a mixture of hymns, songs and prayers so that we can worship our Lord together.
morning everyone. I um, hope you're well and you're looking forward to the summer holidays that will soon be here, won't they? Do you have a best friend? When I was little I had uh, I had two friends, they were called Catherine who lived next door and Christine who I knew from school and we used to like to play together and we used to share our toys and generally have a lot of fun together. I'm sure you've got best friends too. Our Bible reading today is about two people who were the very best of friends and their names were David and Jonathan. And their story is told in a part of the Bible that's called the Old Testament. And it's this bit of the Bible here, if you can see my, my children's Bible, it's this bit here that tells the story of God and the people of Israel in the time before Jesus was born. Now, before we hear about David and Jonathan, we need to know a few things about David first. And if you've done the Brave Trail that Serena put up last weekend, then you'll already know the story of David and Goliath. But for those of you that haven't done it, here's a quick sort of catch up. The king of Israel at that time was a man called Saul. And God wasn't pleased with Saul because he was turning out to be a, a selfish and unjust ruler. So God promised a young shepherd boy, David, that one day he would be king. David always obeyed God's laws and, and God was very pleased with David. Now at that time, the Israelites were fighting an army called the Philistines. And so David went to find his older brothers who were uh, fighting the Philistines, they were soldiers. And when he got to the battle, David was absolutely astonished to find that there was this huge Philistine soldier and a giant of a man, all, all covered in armour. And he was called Goliath. None of the Israelites would go near him. They were terrified. But David offered to kill Goliath. If God had promised to make him king one day, then God would protect him. So he took out his little shepherd's sling, which was a sort of catapult, and he picked up a little pebble and he put it in the sling and he fired it at Goliath. Goliath dropped down, completely out cold, and David picked up his sword and stabbed him. Goliath was dead. Well, the Philistine army just ran away. They were scared. And... So, King Saul was delighted, absolutely thrilled. The, Israeli, the Israelite army had won. In fact, he was so pleased that he invited David to come and live at the palace with him. King Saul had a son called Jonathan, and Jonathan and David grew up together. They became the very best of friends. In fact, they were such good friends that they made a promise before God that they would stay friends forever, whatever ever happened. Well, they grew up, they learnt to be soldiers, and Saul made them leaders of his armies. David turned out to be an excellent soldier. He won loads of battles and he became really famous and popular throughout the whole land of Israel. Saul was not happy. He became Jealous of David. I'm supposed to be the most popular and famous person in Israel, not David. In fact, he hated David so much that he plotted to kill him. Jonathan found out. He tried to stand up for David and persuade his father not to kill him. But Saul was so angry that he even threw his spear at Jonathan, his own son. Jonathan knew he had to help David escape. So he met David in secret and told him that he had to run away. The two friends who'd grown up together, promised to be friends forever, had to part. David ran away to another country and Jonathan called after him. May God be with you always. Jonathan was left behind. 
So here were two friends who really looked out for each other. Jonathan stood up for David and he risked his own life to help David escape. Sometimes we have to stand up for our friends too, don't we? Perhaps if um, someone is teasing one of your friends in the playground, then you have to stand up for them. You have to defend them. That's what friends do for each other. But however close we are to our earthly friends, we have an even better friend in heaven, Jesus. Jesus loves us, cares for us, and will always be there to defend us. He'll never, ever let us down. So shall we say a prayer? Dear Jesus, thank you for our friends and the fun and the laughter we have together. Help us to be kind and loyal. And help me to remember that you are our heavenly friend, loving and caring throughout all our lives, the very best friend we could ever have. Amen. Right, for our craft today, um, what, a while ago there was a, a craze for things called friendship bracelets. You can probably see I've got one on here. And they were just little bits of wool or material and you just sort of wound them together like this and you had one and you gave another one to your friend to show that you were you were best mates. So I thought we'd make some friendship bracelets this morning and they're really, really easy to do. But you do need to get someone else to help you. So you need two or three pieces of coloured wool like this and they need to be about 60 centimetres long and you need to tie a knot in that end there and then you need to get the help of somebody else and they need to hold the knotted end while you that's if you'd like to come around here a bit more that's it got my cameraman helping here you have to twizzle 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 until it's really really tightly wound and tell the person at the other end they mustn't let go Right, so keep twizzling like that. And when you've twizzled it really, really tight, tie a knot in that end too, but don't let it untwizzle. Right, and then what you need to do is you need to get hold of the middle. Don't keep tight. <laughs> right, keep it pulled tight. That's it. You hold the middle, take it off the other person. So you've got it like that and then let go of the of the folded end and shake like mad, like that. <laughs> there we go. And if you finish shaking, you'll see it's all sort of wound round itself. Right, all you've got to do then is just open out the loop a little bit at this end and put your other two ends through. You can see that. And then you can sort of put it on your wrist and you can slide it until it's just a nice fit. So you can get on, it's, it's on and off, but it doesn't fall off. Like that, that's about the right size. And then just tie a big knot in the end here, and that'll stop it going through the loop. Whoops, there we go. That's it. Whoops, there we go. And then it won't come through the knot. And then you can just tidy up the ends here like that and there we are we've got another another friendship bracelet and you can perhaps make one for yourself and make one for a friend perhaps you could do it in I don't know the colours of their favourite football club or something like that if you only got two colours well just do it in two, with two strands if you've only got one well just make it all one colour doesn't really matter but I hope you have a lot of fun doing that and perhaps I'll see you in a little friendship bracelet off Right, bye for now everybody. Have a lovely week. Bye.
Later in the service we're going to share communion together and in preparation for that we're going to think about the last week, maybe a little bit longer, and reflect on the things that we do that aren't helpful, that hurt others and hurt God. So let's pause for a moment to wait in quietness on the Lord and to confess our sins to him. Father God, we're really sorry for all the things in the world that are unjust, all the people who have so few opportunities, whether they don't have enough to eat or whether they aren't protected health-wise or whether they're living in countries with war. Lord, forgive us when we forget those who aren't immediately in front of our eyes. And Lord, as we celebrate the joy of the sporting achievements over this summer, we come to you and ask you to forgive us for the terrible way in which certain players have been treated following the Euro 2020 tournament. Father, we pray that we would embrace the fantastic diversity of this country and not be narrow-minded in our prejudices. And finally, Lord, we bring to you those things that's, which we as individuals have done wrong this week. We thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus to die for us, that we might be clean and be forgiven. And Father, we ask that you would forgive us now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we've confessed our sins, it's good to know that we have been washed whiter than snow and that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. So know that you are forgiven and washed clean and go joyfully into this week. Amen. The first lesson is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 20 verses 1 to 17 and 30 to 42. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to take my life? Never, replied Jonathan, you are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without confiding in me. Why should he hide this from me? It is not so. But David took an oath and said, your father knows very well that I have found favour in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives, as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So David said, look, tomorrow is the new moon festival and I am supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, said Jonathan. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, I wouldn't, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let us go out into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, By the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out my father by this time the day after tomorrow. If he is favourably disposed toward you, I will not send you word and let you know. But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you, as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness, like that of the Lord, as long as I live, so that I may not be killed, and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, 
May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his oath out of love for him, because he loved him as he loved himself. So Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame, and to the shame of your mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor the king, your kingdom will be established. Now send and bring him to me, for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger, and on that second day of the month he did not eat, because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David. He had a small boy with him, and said to the boy, Run and find the arrows I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, Isn't the arrow beyond you? And then he shouted, Hurry, go quickly, don't stop. The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master. The boy knew nothing of all this, only Jonathan and David knew. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said, Go, carry them back to the town. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times, with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants for ever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is taken from Mark, chapter 6, six verses 30 to 44. Jesus feeds the 5,000. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have chance to eat. He said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognised them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his di disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, That would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to the heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was five thousand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to the second in our series about David. And as was often said on a popular TV show, let's start with a quick recap. And just a little invitation that if you've got time this week, you might like to read 1 Samuel chapters 18 to 20, which will give you a bit more of the context. So, 
Saul is becoming increasingly mentally disturbed and isn't following the Lord. So Samuel, unbeknownst to Saul, has been told by God to anoint David as the future king. Later, as Saul struggles with what's described as an evil spirit, one of his servants recommends that David, whose lyre playing might soothe Saul, is invited to come to court. And then, in an abrupt change of setting, the next thing that we hear about David is him taking that courageous stand against the Philistine Goliath, killing him and being fated as a hero. And if you want to find out more about David and Goliath, do come and hear more next week. But for now, I want us to pause for a moment and to stop to think about the word soothe. That word was used, if you recall, about the effect of David's lyre playing on Saul. And it's not a word we use very often, is it? So I wonder what pops into your mind when you hear it. I think of children being soothed by their parents, the restorative power of a walk in God's amazing creation, and our souls being soothed by encountering God's presence in worship. To help us explore this further, last week I heard that it turns out that one of the ways to think about how we function is to consider that we have three basic emotional regulators of our behaviour. And these are called threat, drive and soothe. And when these aren't in balance, we really start to struggle. So let me try to explain them a little bit further. During a pandemic, or indeed whilst worrying who might defend us against a huge Philistine, we naturally perceive a very high degree of threat. Most of us also often experience and exhibit drive, which motivates us to act, like David stepping forward to fight Goliath, or in current times, people mobilising to try to save the planet. But without soothe in the mix, we can't function properly. We all need to feel, feel loved, to feel supported, and to feel protected. Soothe is all about our well-being. Enter Jonathan. Jonathan was King Saul's son and would normally have expected to become king himself in due course. But as he became increasingly aware of his father's failings and noticed that David was having a bigger and bigger impact on the nation, his feelings changed by God's grace. So we read, after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Jonathan's profession of love and friendship here is nothing short of extraordinary and we clearly see God's hand at work. We're told that Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. What amazing friendship, which must have been immensely soothing for David. But Jonathan goes much further forward than this. He actually takes off the regalia of a crown prince, robe, tunic, sword, bow and belt and transfers them together with the rights they confer to David. And it's clear that this isn't just some flamboyant gesture because it's described as a legally binding agreement, a covenant. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. And through these actions, Jonathan has chosen to step aside and to recognise David, not him, as Saul's heir apparent. So let's pause for a moment to think about people in our lives, either now or in our past, who've been extraordinary friends to us. 
You may not be surprised to know that I've been watching far too much Grey's Anatomy during lockdown. And in that show, the main characters each have their person. Someone who, to use an American phrase, has their back and will do anything and everything they possibly can to support them. Jonathan was David's person. I wonder, who is yours? But before we move on, let's fast forward to one of David's descendants, Jesus. And Jesus, echoing, albeit on a global scale, what, Je what Jonathan did for David, let's remember that Jesus chose to lay aside his majesty and give up everything so that we could be sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. As, en as events unfold, it's clear that David is going to need soothing. He'll need protecting. He'll need to be able to trust someone and he'll need to be cared for. First of all, we discover that Saul is actually hoping to pin David against the wall with a spear. But by God's grace, David somehow manages to escape. You might also remember that after defeating Goliath, Saul had given David a very high rank in the army. But then a situation developed that was kind of tricky for Saul because simultaneously he was delighted and annoyed because David now goes on to command thousands of troops to victory in battle. His popularity soars as a result and he marries Saul's daughter, Michal. Then things get really bad. We read that Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. Wow! Jonathan immediately warns his friends and seemingly manages to sort everything out so that David can return to court with Saul. But soon afterwards, as Saul once again tries to kill David with a spear, David's wife warns him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So David is now on the run and desperate. He finally manages to meet Jonathan and asks, what have I done? What's my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied. You are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. Now we come to the crunch, to the real test of David and Jonathan's friendship. But David took an oath and said, your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he'll be grieved. Yet, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only one step between me and death. Who will Jonathan choose to protect? His father Saul or his friend David? Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. What a friend. And so they managed to work out a plan, which you heard read earlier, and they paused to reaffirm their commitment to God and to each other. Jonathan said, may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father, but show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. When it becomes obvious that Saul is bent on killing David, the plan involving a boy and the shooting of arrows unfolds and ends up saving David's life. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together. But David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, 
The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. In these uncertain days, we all need soothing. So during this coming week, here are three things to consider taking forward. Why not take time to recall those who have offered you extraordinary kindness and reflect on what in particular you have valued about their friendship? Secondly, pray that the Lord would create opportunities for you to soothe others. And finally, give thanks with a grateful heart for all that the Lord has done for you may be using these words from an old hymn. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fears. Amen. Almighty God, we ask that you hear us as we pray for the church, the world, those around us and those in need. Father God, we pray for the Christian church throughout the world, for all who live lives dedicated to your service. We pray for all who have been imprisoned for their faith, for all who at this time are facing persecution or danger, for those who stand firmly for freedom and justice. We ask you to give them strength and hope to carry on as they pursue peace in this troubled world. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we pray for our parish as we face changes ahead. We pray for Sally and Steve as they prepare for pastures new, especially for Sally with her mission to bring more people to know you. We pray for our PCC and those who will continue to provide worship at St Swithin's and all who lead, organise and assist in our church activities. We also pray for Zoe, our administrator. We ask for your guidance and strength for our church community and that you help us to work together in mutual support during the months ahead. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all in authority in this country, making important decisions on our behalf. Especially as we come out of lockdown and freedom beckons, may they serve us with wisdom and integrity for the good of all. As people are busily re rebuilding working lives and venturing out, we ask your help to keep us all safe and your guidance for people to behave sensibly, protect the vulnerable and not to act selfishly. Many people live in parts of the world where poverty and corruption are preventing access to vaccines. We ask for your help and guidance to world leaders so that vaccines and medical help reach everyone. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our environment, giving thanks for local parks and green spaces that have been so important for our health and well-being, especially those that have been used as places for quiet meditation, reflection and prayer. We give thanks for those who tend the churchyard and encourage conservation, for those who plant trees and open their gardens for others to enjoy. Show us ways we can all help to enhance the beauty of our surroundings and remind us all to protect the natural gifts you have given us. We pray for those we love and live with, for our neighbours and friends, especially those who have heard the good news of your son but have not been able to take it in or have rejected it. We pray for the opening of ears, eyes and hearts to you. And as we approach the end of term, we pray for our school children, some leaving primary school and venturing out to new schools and new beginnings. We pray that they leave having known friendship and love at the school that will carry them forward with confidence. We pray for the teachers and the leaders at the school and all schools locally who have been so dedicated to their work throughout the challenges of the past year and we give thanks that you have kept them and the children of our parish safe at school this year. We pray that they all have a well-earned rest and return from the summer holidays refreshed and renewed for the new year. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we pray for those in any kind of need in body, mind or spirit. 
We pray for all those who long to be free, for those who seek asylum and refuge from their past, for the increasing number of people trafficked, human lives being bought and sold, for those whose health is failing and so taking away the freedom they used to know, for those working long hours with little pay, for those caught up in a cycle of unemployment, poverty and hunger who wish to be free from these worries, and those who are experiencing illness, suffering or loneliness and long to be free from these pains. Loving God, who sent your Son to free us from our sins, take into your arms all those who long to be free. In our community, we think of all those we have been asked to pray for, and we bring them before you now, Lord, in a moment of silence. Fill them with your healing and surround them with your love. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, we pray for all those who are coming to the end of their life on this earth, and for those who have recently died and are now at peace in your eternal presence. Be close to those who miss them and those who are grieving. We pray for those who remember a loved one whose anniversary falls at this time as they hold on to precious memories. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We now come to share bread and wine in a form that's accessible to as many people as possible. So the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. And we're going to hear a reading from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. 
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we are going to come to the responses now and if you would like to say the words in bold. The way that it works is those words are normally just a repeat of the last phrase that I've said. This bread reminds us of Jesus' body. It reminds us of Jesus. It reminds us of Jesus. This wine reminds us of Jesus' blood. It reminds us of Jesus. It reminds us of Jesus. We have this bread and wine to share. They remind us of Jesus. They remind us of Jesus. So we're going to come now to share bread and wine together. Uh, if you haven't prepared the elements, please do pause this video and go and get them and then we'll be able to share at the Lord's table together. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in the one bread. And as we think of the importance of Jesus' sacrifice for us, we're going to say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So another section with some responses, which again will be in bold on the screen. Lord Jesus, we come to this table with nothing to give. Please welcome us. Please welcome us. We come to this table with empty hands. Please share your bread with us. Please share your bread with us. We come to this table to meet with you. Please come to us. Please come to us. So draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
So as you reflect on friendship, as you reflect on being soothed by those whom you love and who love you and by our Father God, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.